You're tuned in to More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcast live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for over 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. And, you know, if you're nearing retirement, you may not have the time to keep up with the important information and actions necessary to keep your retirement plan on track. And you may not know all the tools you need in order to upkeep your retirement plan. If you're already in retirement, it can feel like your new full-time job to keep up with every single detail of the markets, and how it impacts your retirement portfolio. Now, no one, as we know, can predict the future, but everyone can have a financial plan to help weather the financial storms that may lie ahead. So today, we're going to be discussing topics and bringing in real-world examples to illustrate how your retirement could get blown off course and what you can do to prevent it. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about, in the first segment, The risk you face in retirement that you do not face at any other time in your life that has to be accounted for. We're also going to talk later in the show about how inflation is sticking around and what that means and how can you mitigate the impact of inflation. We'll provide an overall market update and we'll talk about the risk of needing to retire early and what that could do and what what are your best options if you have to retire early. Now, when you're approaching retirement, you you are approaching crossing a very distinctive line uh, that other people don't have to deal with in their financial planning, and that is you no longer have earned income when you retire. And there are a couple of big issues that that brings up. One is certainly you're needing to withdraw from your investments, right, and you don't have the type of time on your side to recover from economic and stock market short-term volatility in many cases because you need income in retirement. Uh, And then on the other hand, you're also not making significant investments uh, once you're retired because you're not saving and accumulating money. You're withdrawing and spending the money. You know, when you're 55, if you're planning on retiring at 65, and we have a significant downturn in the market, you know, you no longer have time on your side to recover from market decline, but you also are going to be putting large, large chunks of money in, and you're going to be doing that while the market is down. You know, typically our last 10 years of work, we're contributing the most of our entire life into our retirement accounts, especially things like 401ks and 403bs. Well, when the markets dip, you know, we don't like the way that looks on our statement. But the flip side is we're getting to invest systematically every paycheck while the market is down. So you actually have an opportunity to benefit somewhat from short-term volatility as long as you have enough time on your side. So... You've got to change the mindset to a distribution uh, and income mindset. You know, you've worked hard to amass wealth. Now you've got to protect it from the short-term impact of market volatility. You've also got to make it last for the rest of your life. And inflation in the long term is maybe as powerful an opponent as there is. You know, last year we've seen record highs in the stock market. We have seen more market volatility creep up in the last couple of months. You know, the state of the market at the time you retire is not within your control, and no one can predict where it will be in the future. Are you positioned properly? So when you're nearing and in retirement, 
you need to be concerned about a risk that other workers don't have to really worry about nearly as much. And that is, I'll call it market timing risk. When are the good years in the market? When are the bad years? Now, we call that sequence of return risk. You know, we know the markets over time make pretty good money. Um, but, you know, if you average 7% per year or 6% per year or, heck, even 5% per year over your entire lifetime, which is not a, a you know, a, a bold assumption, the reality is, even if that, even if you do average six percent per year over a twenty-five or thirty-year lifetime in retirement, you know you don't click along making six percent year after year after year. You have good years and you have bad years. And what happens in the bad years? You know, some someone retiring during a bear market or have seeing a bear market in those early years of retirement. You may, you may see your portfolio recover as the market does, but you're also seeing a reduction in overall returns in the dollar amounts because you had to withdraw money when prices were down. One of the real keys to being successful with money, period, is to not have to spend an investment loss. And if we have to sell something off when it's down, and then spend it for income. That's exactly what we're doing. We'll compound our losses and that money will never ever come back. So that is something that as younger folks, you know, when you're in your 30s and even your 40s and even your early and mid 50s, if you're working until your mid 60s, you have some time on your side to see how the markets average out. But you, unfortunately, if you don't have kind of income plan in retirement, you typically don't have that benefit of time. So we need to build time into the retirement plan. Now, there are a few different ways to reduce the risk of sequence of return risk. And you've kind of already heard me talking about a little bit my favorite way, um, which is to sequence your money based on when you're going to need it and have your short-term needs met by fixed and or stable holdings. Now, short term to me needs to be at least four or five years. That you, your needs for the, for the next four or five years for income are covered where you can withdraw monies from things like CDs, individual bonds, treasuries, guaranteed interest contracts, things that have stability, even guaranteed principal. Now, when I say guaranteed principal, of course, you got to look at who's backing the guarantee. But you're living on certainty that way. Um, and so I'm a big believer in income ladders where, you know, let's say you're going to retire in a year and you need to withdraw $20,000. Let's say you've got 600000 invested and you need to withdraw 20000 to supplement your income. Well, then we would take 20000 and buy a one-year CD. Then we'd take another 20000 and buy a two-year CD, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is when you get there, you can use that matured CD money uh, to fund your income need. And it's a certainty it'll be there if, if it's FDIC insured or at least it's backed by the federal government. So we we, we kind of limit the impact of short-term volatility in the markets because short-term volatility is a reality. That's what we deal with with the markets. The problem is, and I'm going to talk about it later, but, in, but the stock market is the number one way, or has been, the number one way to fight inflation over time. And inflation, you know, the, the data suggests... When you retire, you're going to live 25 to 30 years in retirement. That's how long people are living long uh, now. So inflation is a huge risk. And the stock market historically has been the best way to beat that risk. But the reality of the stock market is short-term volatility. So we can mitigate that by laddering for income in that first four, five, six years of retirement. Now, that to me is the preferred way because that way you can set your income need and then you can draw for it and then have it increase over time for inflation. 
However, there are other ways to plan for sequence of return risk. They just have their drawbacks. One is limit how much money you need to withdraw out. You know, if you want to draw three and a half, four percent per year from your investments right out of the gate in year one in retirement, and that is your long-term projection, like that's with Social Security added in and any other income sources added in, you know, if you're going to draw three and a half, four percent, that's not limiting the withdrawal rate. Now, if you only need one and a half or two percent, or maybe two and a half percent, then, you know, your sequence of return risk is not nearly as great. So let's put real numbers on that. If you have a million dollar portfolio, and we'll just use round numbers, if you, if you need 20 or 25,000 a year from your savings to supplement your other income and social security, well, that's a two, a two, two and a half percent withdrawal rate. But if you need 35,000 or 40,000, that's a three and a half to four percent rate. When it is a low percentage, let's say two and a half or lower, certainly, certainly two and a half or lower, then the sequence of return risk is not as great. Um, I mentioned the income laddering. Now, tapping home equity is actually also a reasonable strategy for drawing income in down markets. The idea would be you have a home equity line, or you might later in life do a reverse mortgage, um, and I'm gonna talk, I'll, I'll touch on that here in just a second, but you, you, you know, you have a home equity line or a reverse mortgage. You have equity you can tap, and so when the market substantially dips, you don't have to sell off your risk investments and, and, and spend those investment losses where you compound your losses. So tapping home equity can be a strategy, but then that incurs, in today's world, fairly high interest rates, right? So your interest costs go up, and then, you know, the idea would be once the market comes back and recovers, you can pay that home equity back down. You know, one, uh, another option would be a cash reserve bucketing strategy. You know, you have some cash set aside to be able to get you through a good couple of years worth if the market were to crater. Uh, and then, the, the, you know, the drawback there, that's reasonable, but the drawback is that cash, having to put that much aside, you're just not going to earn much on it. Now, in today's world, you can earn 5% on money markets. So that is a, a decent alternative. You just don't want to have too much money in those alternatives because if interest rates do start dropping, then you'll immediately be making less money because, you you know, a, a CD wouldn't, but a money market would because it changes daily in terms of what it can make. So, you know, those are different ways to plan for the risk of sequence of return risk, market timing, what happens in the market in those in those two or three years leading up to retirement and in your first five or six years of retirement because you're going to be withdrawing from your investments and if, there's a, if you have to sell off significant losses in the market, that can be devastating. So those are just some effective ways to fight that. My favorite is to sequence your money and ladder for income to get you through the next four to six years where you don't have to touch your risk investments and can ride through the inevitable ups and downs because that's the nature of the markets. But that risk money is going to give you your best chance to beat inflation. Now, when we come back, we don't know how long inflation will last, but we can prepare. What is the latest on inflation and what does it mean for you and me? So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back. This is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. We're with you every Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m. and again from 3 to 4 p.m. You can also catch all of our podcasts. You can go to BroganFinancial.com and listen to them if you click on radio. You can also download them on your favorite podcast app, particularly Spotify and Apple Podcast. Just type in More Living with Jim Brogan. We're talking today about some of the financial challenges that we face. And, of course, inflation in the past few years has been a real issue. 
And many of you, most of you, would probably say it's still an issue now. You know, we've seen in the past few years increased government spending. We've seen supply chain disruptions, geopolitical conflict. The aftermath, one of them is inflation. We all feel it in our wallets now. But how long will prices continue to rise and by how much? You know, the Federal Reserve meets periodically to discuss the state of the economy and the consumer price index known as the CPI. And they regularly update broad pricing trends. So how does this affect retirement and what do you need to be aware of? Um, You know, the inflation rate as of January... Through January, the last 12 months, inflation's up 3.1% from a year ago. Understanding what it is and why it matters and how to handle it can, of course, help tremendously in your financial decisions. The rate of inflation was up 0.3% in January. So if we, you know, if we extrapolate that out for 12 months, it would be 3.6. But in the last three months, 12 months, it's been 3.1. And that's according to to the latest release from the Bureau of Labor. Uh, the Bureau of Labor notes that the index for shelter housing contributed to more than two thirds of that in, uptick. So it includes housing. And the next monthly update for February, we're now here in the first of March. It'll be released March the twelfth. Now, three point one percent inflation rate on the surface may not seem like a lot or as much as the price changes you've noticed at the grocery store. So to put it in context, over the last few years, consumer price inflation between January of 2020 and January 2024 went up 19.6% in those four years. 19.6% price increases and had particularly high housing cost increases. So these are big numbers, and I think that 19.6 number over four years percent, that's why even with inflation at 3% now, 3.1, it just feels like you're getting squeezed. Because that 3.1 is on top of a couple of big numbers the last couple of years. You know, we had that one year, it was over 8.5%, right? So Prices have not been coming back down. They've reset at a higher place. And that's why we don't feel like inflation is coming down. Because in the last four years, it's almost 20% increase in consumer prices. And even more in housing, even more in medical costs. There are certain areas where we definitely see increased costs at higher than the inflation rate. And, And many of you would say that's happening at the grocery store. So if you think about how inflation erodes your money, you know, after an initial year, the price of a hypothetical purchase in that year and a final year to see how much inflation has changed the value of money during that period, it'll show you how much purchasing power the money has lost. In other words, what would $100 buy you at the grocery store today as opposed to $100 a year ago today or four years ago today? You know, with 20% increases, you know, if and food, I think, is groceries for most of us has been even higher than that. You know, what what paid for $100 four years ago today would be we'd need probably $125 or we're losing purchasing power. Now, what does the historical data show us? You know, if we look at CPI for the 30 years from 1989 to 2019, and I think that's important because it does not include the 1970s, and the 70s was such a, an anomaly in our history. The average in annual inflation rate for the 30 years ending in 2019 was 2.5% per year. Now, the Federal Open Market Committee, which is the arm of the U.S. Bank that makes decisions about managing the nation's money supply, it targets a 2% rate of inflation over time. Now, as I said, the prices of different goods and services can rise at different rates. You know, education and health care costs, for example, are generally about double 
the inflation rate. Long-term care costs are typically double the inflation rate. Um, so we've, you know, that can really be an impact, and we feel it through the economy. As prices rise, you just can can buy a lot less. We we see it a lot more now because it's been so high the last four years. The reality is inflation, even at 2.5%, is a, is a real risk in retirement over a long period of time. And I call it the cholesterol of retirement income because it's, I call it the silent killer. You know, it kind of sneaks up on you. Inflation isn't like losing 30 or 40% in a market downturn where it hits all at once and it's so painful. Instead, it just slowly creeps up on you over a period of 8, 10, 15 years and all of a sudden you wake up and you feel like, you know, where'd my money go? So how can you protect against this kind of inflation? You know, I don't think inflation's going to average 4 or 5% over the next 20 years. Um, I think 2.5% is probably more, more reasonable. You might want to use a 3% rate right now on your assumptions and your retirement projections. But how can you protect against this impact? Now, one, one thing that's important is to avoid ho- hoarding a lot of cash. You know, cash historically just doesn't provide much return. Now, there are, as I said earlier, there are money, mar- you know, there are money markets now that are paying 5%. You can get a treasury money market fund paying 5%. But I don't know how long that'll last. And those types of funds, the, the rate can change daily or weekly. So when rates go down, they will immediately go back down. And we see that in, 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 in what's baked into CD rates, you know. Up to an 18-month CD, you can still get 5% or better, but if you go out 24 months, it starts to drop to about 4.7, 4.8% if you go out two years. And if you go out five years, it drops under two and a half, over under 4.5%. That's because the banks expect interest rates to come down. <coughs> so, excuse me. Hoarding cash is certainly a way to, 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 to where inflation could really eat you up a little bit. Now, another way is to diversify your portfolio, not just have one asset class of even like stocks. Historically, yes, the stock market has produced the best hedge for inflation. But in the short term, inflation can, can negatively affect the stock market. <coughs> and there are other Asset classes that may hold their value better in inflationary times. Some some investments are more inflation tolerant than others or rise together with inflation. Things like real assets, you know, real estate, commodities, precious metals, gold and silver. Real assets often retain value or provide pricing power in inflation, in short-term inflationary example, I mean, just look at landlords right now. With rental properties, they sometimes raise rents as inflation rises. Uh, so real assets can offer more diversification in your portfolio. It gives you a little bit more of a short-term hedge. But again, in the longer term, the stocks are the best way to hedge inflation, especially quality stocks with proven earnings growth, proven Dividend yields, low debt, interest rates tend to rise with inflation, and so you you know you want to look. I mean, stocks, companies that don't have a lot of debt, often are better positioned to meet inflationary demands than other types of companies. And then you know most people when they buy bonds or bond funds stick with what I would call traditional U.S. bonds. So a, a fund, a mutual fund or an ETF that buys traditional U.S. bonds, they're, for example, buying a bunch of the bonds that maybe maybe one of the bonds they own is a Coca-Cola bond, and it matures in five years. So the problem with those kind of bonds is if interest rates go up, those bond values go down. Now, the opposite's true. If interest rates go down, those values go up. But... Interest rate sensitivity is a negative of bond funds, but there are other types of bond funds that can actually go up with rising rates. Things like bonds with adjustable rates. You know, that'd be like the equivalent of a of an adjustable rate mortgage versus a fixed rate mortgage. If a bank is lending money to a big U.S. corporation, 
and the interest rate resets every month or every quarter, then when rates go up, the bank's going to make even, you know, going to make it more interest. So how you, when I talk about diversification, it's more than just within the stock market. It's more than just including real assets in your diversification. It's also being properly diversified in terms of your bond exposure and having bond diversification to hedge risk. So it's very important. And then I would say the other part of that that's, that's equally important is what I talked about last segment is making sure that you have income to draw from that is not subject to market volatility. And yes, it's not going to earn as much, but then your market investments, you can invest with a little bit longer time horizon, which allows you to have more money over time, hopefully beat inflation. So those are some tips. As as we are seeing stickier inflation, uh, the Fed is, than maybe what was originally expected. Now, when we come back, we'll talk about the state of the markets. We'll talk about volatility. We'll talk about inflation and the Federal Reserve, what's likely around the corner, and what should we be doing with our money. So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. This is More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. We we come to you every Saturday only on News Talk 98.7 WOKI, but you can catch our podcasts uh, if you use your Apple Podcast or Spotify, just type in More Living with Jim Brogan, or you can go to my website at broganfinancial.com and click on radio. Uh, I will tell you the next college class, adult education, is through the, the community outreach at Pellissippi State Hardin Valley. And it is for people that are getting ready to retire or already retired. And it is a one-night class, income planning for retirement. So in two, in one two hour session, I talk as comprehensively as I can. Now Eric Ballou in my office helps me with that class and we talk as comprehensively as we possibly can about the major things you need to do with your income plan because I think income planning is the most overlooked area in retirement planning today. That class is on Tuesday, April the 9th. Again, that's Tuesday, April the 9th, income planning for retirement. You can get more information at my website if you go to broganfinancial.com. Uh, click on classes. You can also go to P- PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com if you like. And then I have another class in on May the 7th, tax planning in your retirement. So those are the, the, the next classes I have. Both of those are one-night classes. I'd love to see you there. And Eric Ballou and I give you as much information as we possibly can to be successful and make informed and prudent decisions that can impact the quality of your life. Now, the effects of interest rates and inflation don't just impact your budget. They they affect many different parts of the economy and your retirement investment portfolio. You know, markets have been up, especially last year, especially in November and December. Um, relying on the whims of the market in the short term and hoping to avoid a recession are not retirement strategies. So you'll benefit from a retirement plan that's built to last through both easy and difficult market conditions because we know we're going to have difficult market conditions. We just don't know when or why. So you need a plan that will stand up during those volatile economic conditions. Now, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell does not predict a recession. But inflation seems to be slightly stickier than anticipated, which means interest rates may stay where they are or come down slower than anticipated. And, you know, the, the consensus coming into this year is that the Fed would probably do one rate decrease. You know, they, they, they pretty much took rates from zero to over 5% in really just a couple of years, and the thought is they'll start decreasing rates again because they don't want to cause a recession, And in, but, but employment is still, unemployment is still very low. Consumer spending is still pretty good, although consumers are racking up more debt now 
according to the data. Uh, but the Fed's trying to, you know, they want that soft landing where we don't see a recession or, or very, very mild at worst. Uh, but it, it could become trickier because they're not going to cut rates as much. Uh, many thought the end of the second quarter, sometime in the first half of the year, there would be an interest rate reduction. I think most observers feel like that is now off the table and there will not be an interest rate reduction the first six months this year. Um, and then my thinking had been maybe a couple of rate decreases in the last half of the year. I think that's starting to look a little bit more questionable. Maybe one to two re- rate decreases. I have a hard time seeing we would have none, but it could happen if inflation proves to be stickier. And elevate, elevated interest rates for longer means markets have an added barrier, right? Businesses, if they the cost of capital is greater, if they want to expand, everything it, it just costs more. High rates could be more mean more market volatility or bigger market downturns, which could affect your market exposed accounts. Certainly your IRAs, your 401ks. Uh, now, despite this war on inflation, Powell does believe a recession is unlikely, but it remains a possibility if the current inflationary conditions persist and the Fed is forced to keep rates high. So, you know, what that means is if, if, if rates continue to stay higher and inflation continues to stay stickier, I expect the market to be more choppy. Okay, but here's the bottom line. We don't invest in the market for what it'll be. We shouldn't invest in the market for what it'll be. Our money might be worth next month or even next year because we have no idea what the market will be worth next month or even next year. I mean, if you said, Jim, where is the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Stock Index going to be a year from today on March 2nd of 2025? I might as well go to Las Vegas and throw craps. Nobody knows. You know, the shorter the period of time that we're looking at, the more unpredictable the market is. And this has been borne out historically. You know, what are the what what is the range of potential market outcomes over the next 12 months? I mean, the market could be down 30%. The market could be up 30%. So that is an extraordinary variance of where we could be a year from now. But if you said, where's the market going to be 10 years from now? Well, it's not going to lo- it's not very probable we would see minus 30% per year for the next 10 years. And it's also very, very improbable we would see making 30% per year for the next 10 years. So the, the potential outcome of market investments, especially, let's just say the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, if we're looking out 10 years, the range of outcomes, the range of possibilities shrinks way down. It'd be extremely unusual to have a 10-year period without it having some kind of positive return. Now, we did have that from 2000, actually to 2012, we had a 12-year run where the total return of the S&P 500 was right at 0%. So it can happen. That was somewhat of an anomaly. We had two worse-than-average bear markets in a seven-year period, you know, with the the dot-com bubble bursting in 2000, and then we had the Great Recession that started in the fall of 2007. And that's an anomaly. But, you know, we see anomalies and those things that can happen. But my point is... Measured over 10 years, I don't know that we've ever had an outcome. I'd have to go back and look at the 1930s with the Great Depression, but I don't know that we've had an outcome of 10 years that's been worse than a minus 2 or 3% per year. And typically, it's all overwhelmingly your worst case scenario is to be up a few percent per year. Now, you're also not going to be up 25% per year. So the point of that is, if I'm measuring it over 10 years, I've got a lot more predictability in the market. If I'm measuring it over one year, I have no predictability. None. Nobody knows. We can take strategic, educated uh, decisions, but we, we, we just don't know. So that goes back to kind of that, 
you know, how we sequence our income. But I think, you know, the market is likely, I think there's a pretty good likely the market gets choppier this year. We're already seeing more choppiness in the market. We've got a presidential election coming up this fall. We have tremendous geopolitical uncertainty. All of those things can lead to a more choppy, volatile stock market. But the data says that given time, those independent events don't seem to have any lasting, long-lasting impact on the market, stock market in a negative way. But it can cause short-term volatility. So it's about putting your money in investments that are appropriate for the time horizon for which you're investing. If you don't want to be a market speculator which I do not believe in. You might be right several times, and then when you're wrong, you're big, wrong in a big way, and it just could blow everything up. We know that given time, a diversified market portfolio that's not just in the stock market but has real assets and a diversification of bonds that can go, that can go up with rising rates in addition to, to up with decreasing rates um, can give you great balance and diversification and a high degree of confidence if you have your income needs secured for at least the next several years without touching market investments if they happen to be substantially down. So I think you can be very effective with, you know, the the likelihood of choppy markets. And I say the likelihood, I mean, we know markets are volatile and we know they're unpredictable. So it, it, it's very likely. It's it's it, it's you know if the other, the only thing that's predictable about the stock market is that it's unpredictable and that it's volatile. We have periods of calm and we have periods of choppy. So you're, we don't know. When, we never know, in my view, when the when one cycle is going to end and the next cycle is going to begin. So in a good financial plan that layers income for the short term and then targets growth for the longer term to fight inflation. I believe with the right plan, you can be very, very successful. Now, these are the kinds of things I talk about in my income planning class uh, that's going to be at Pellissippi State Community College on Tuesday, December, excuse me, April the 9th. You can go to PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com to find out more information. Uh, Again, that's a one-night class Tuesday, April the 9th. I'd love to see you there in two hours. We don't get heavy into the weeds of investments in that class, but we do get heavy into how we sequence investments for time horizon, which is so critically important. Now, when we come back from our last break, what happens when you retire early? You may have to retire early. It might not be your choice. How can you react to those types of events? How can you be successful? Stay with us. This is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. This is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Thank you for tuning in this morning here on News on, uh, News Talk. We're with you every Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m. and again from 3 to 4 p.m. You know, Most Americans plan retiring at a retirement age of around 65, 67, something like that. Uh, But many Americans may end up not having the option to work. You might get an early retirement. It can start earlier than we think. Now, keep in mind you still may have options when this occurs. And it does happen more often than people realize. And I think given that it does happen, everyone should have a preliminary plan for what would happen if you were forced to, out of your job early. So if, what are some tips that you can be thinking about if you're about, if you've just been downsized or, or forced into early retirement? What are the types of things that you can be thinking about? I think one is take a deep breath. You know, you don't want to make drastic financial moves. That could adversely affect your retirement planning. You know, for example, if you immediately drained a significant amount of out of your 401k, it would trigger large tax ramifications, more than likely, and it could it could trigger tax penalties. 
So take a, take a deep breath. Work on a budget based on your new circumstances. Review your sources of income. Are you going to draw from a pension, savings? Did you get some severance that you can structure into your income plan? How should you structure your investments? Then look at your expenses and how the expenses will change now that you're not working and how you can cut your expenses. Because certainly if you're, you know, if you downsized early, you probably really need to take a hard look at how much you're spending. But, but take a deep breath. Don't panic. You know, if you're a two-salary family, then can you live on one salary when you've always lived on two? So take a deep breath and really evaluate your budget, where the money's going, what your income sources are, and how you can use your assets to provide supplemental income. Now, another tip would be consider working part-time. You know, even if your full-time job is no more, you consider a part-time gig to bring in some money. Every dollar you earn is one less dollar that you'll have to pull out of your savings and investments. It literally could be the difference in a plan that works versus a plan that is not going to work or may not work. All right, and some part-time jobs, especially large employers, offer... Health benefits, health insurance. Um, a job loss can also be an opportunity to become your own boss. So, you know, maybe you could do some consulting work. Maybe there's a hobby that you could turn into some part-time work. Anything you can do to generate a little extra income, it could be extremely valuable. Um, now, when you need to tap your savings, one tip would be, be smart about which accounts you tap and what are the income tax implications. You know, if if you want to minimize taxes on your withdrawals, and if you get an early retirement, that is critically important. You know, if you have a million dollars and you need to pull out 30000 for income, but that means for taxes you need to pull out 45000 you know, 15000 goes to the government, 30000 goes to you. Your asset base has just been decreased by 45000 So, you know, you, you've, you've, you've had a pretty big impact on your life savings. But if you pull out 30000 and you don't generate any income taxes on that 30000 then your income base is on, your your asset base is only going down by 30000 rather than 45000 so accessing your taxable accounts where you've already paid the income tax rather than things like IRAs and 401ks and 403bs can be an effective way to blunt the impact of an early, a surprising early retirement. And then finally, avoid retirement plan penalties if you're before age 59 and a half. You know, be aware of those potential penalties and how that may impact you and have a plan to get to, to we, we really don't want to pay penalties. If you just have to withdraw from a retirement account pre-59 and a half, now number one, there's one exception where if you, if you are, uh, if you leave an employer starting in the year you turn 55 or later, you can access that plan. You cannot access your other plans without penalty, but you can access that plan. You know, you could take Social Security sooner or later, and your Social Security strategy would then become even more important if you were forced into an early retirement. So I think all of these things are critically important. You know, today we've discussed inflation. You know, we've discussed about market timing risk, sequence of return risk, if there's big market decreases in the early years of retirement. Um, We've discussed an early layoff, early retirement. Ultimately, we've discussed your wealth because greater wealth provides for more living so you can live the best years of your life your way. Thank you for tuning in this week. Thank you to Jennifer for engineering the show. Thank you to Jill for helping produce the show. Do check out my upcoming class. Go to PellissippiRetirementPlanning.com. It's at Pellissippi State on Tuesday, April the 9th. It's a one-night class, income planning for retirement. I'd love to see you there. Thank you for tuning in this week. Have a very blessed weekend. You've been listening to More Living with Jim Brogan, only on News Talk 98.7 WOKI.
The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.